But anyway, that being said, um, uh, I'm going to invite you to open your Bible. And by the way, if you're missing a Bible, one of you ladies out there might be missing a women's Bible. Does this look familiar to anybody? Scott, is this yours? Is that what you're raising your hand? <laughs> All right. Well, if you're afraid to raise your hand, it's right here. And I'll make sure nobody watches while you come get it afterwards. So, But you've been un- unarmed all week. How'd you get away with that? So, no sword with you? Okay, anyway. So we're going to be in John chapter 16 this morning. If you've got your Bible handy, go ahead and open it up. And uh, this section we're looking at this morning is actually the last part of what Jesus had to say to his disciples before he ultimately prays. And then uh, ultimately they're in the garden in that. Um, but of, of these few chapters that we've been reading in uh, what started as an upper room discourse and has sort of begun and uh, continued as an ongoing conversation on the way to the uh, Mount of Olives, uh, Jesus now is going to essentially, short of his prayer, kind of wrap up what he is imparting to his disciples uh, in these hours and final, final hours, really, before he's to be arrested. And so we're going to pick it up in verse 25 of chapter 16 of the Gospel of John where Jesus says, I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have have come into the world, and now I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. And his disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figures of speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. And Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it's now come when you shall be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I'm not alone, for the Father is with me. I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. I honestly couldn't think of a better passage to land on this morning. Uh, And in these days, in general, uh, in the days we find ourselves, well, Jesus, as uh, the disciples have mentioned, has been speaking in some cases in figures of speech. We've seen this throughout uh, a lot of his ministry, and uh, and even in in this last section where he's been sharing in this upper room time and on on the way to the Mount of Olives, he has uh, used figures of speech like the vine, the branches, the woman in travail uh, giving birth, and all of these kinds of things. Um, Jesus, throughout his ministry, again, used lots of analogies and such, and told these stories to help teach lessons and to share uh, uh, eternal truth. Um, In chapter 10, he spoke about being the shepherd and being the door to the sheep and such, but it says, interestingly, they didn't understand what he meant. You know, there were times when he would share a parable and then afterward explain it. Matter of fact, the parable, the the one that is sort of seen as the key to unlocking so many of the others, uh, the parable of the seed and the uh, the sower and the seed and the soils. Um, and Jesus, after explaining that one, uh, goes on to say, well, or, uh, or in beginning to explain that one, he says, if you don't understand this one, how will you understand any of the parables? And so this becomes sort of an, a, help, a help to understanding so many of them. But he spoke in parabolic language. Uh, People surmise different reasons why he may have spoken that way at one time or another. But we do know that from the disciples' standpoint, they found it rather confusing from time to time. And here they finally appreciate that he's speaking plainly. Now, I take a lot of comfort in that, by the way. You know, these were the disciples. These were the apostles. These were the guys Jesus handpicked. And sometimes they just didn't quite understand what was going on. Uh, I feel that way periodically. You know, I'm, I'm, okay, what is this supposed to mean? And that kind of thing. So I take a little comfort from that. But I take even greater comfort when Jesus says that he's going to speak plainly and tell them about the Father. Uh, You can understand why their sense of, oh, now, good, okay. Uh, Not just that he's not going to speak in ways that are confusing, but think about what he just said he's going to do. He's going to tell them about the Father. Now, significantly, John 17, which is rightly called by many Jesus' high priestly prayer, Uh, He gives such insight into his relationship with the Father, the relationship that he's called us to enjoy with the Father, and the relationship that his followers are called to invite others to enjoy with the Father. Uh, And there is such love and communion between the Father and Son in this prayer as Jesus opens 
uh, his mouth and shares these glorious, beautiful words with his Father in heaven. And we'll spend time, obviously, uh, after we finish today, we'll begin to move into that section. Um, but if Jesus sat in this room here and said, let me tell you about the Father, it'd be kind of exciting, it'd be kind of uh, just exhilarating, the thought that we're going to hear what God is like. Well, Jesus has been sharing that both verbally through his, uh, not just his words, but also even through his deeds throughout his entire ministry. Uh, he has shared through his ministry and through the words that he, sa- uh, that he has uh, spoken, he has spoken about love and mercy. He's spoken about love for sinners. Those who are outcasts of society are welcomed and embraced by the Father. Jesus demonstrated that, of course, throughout his ministry as he sat and ate with tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes, and he was just, he was a friend of sinners, something that uh, the, the religiously righteous will always, or self-righteous, will always struggle with. But Jesus made known that this is what the heart of God is like. Quite the contrast to what most people tend to think of when they think of God. First off, oftentimes they think it's confusing to even talk about knowing God. How can you know? Well, Jesus came to answer that question in great detail. And as people began to hear what he said and watch what he did, watch the way he interacted with people, he could rightly say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so here he is now, wrapping up what he's going to say to them as he finishes making his way to the garden where he will ultimately be handed over to the hands of sinful men. In the days to come, He'll be crucified. He'll rise from the dead three days later. He'll commission his disciples, one of the very plain spoken things that he will say to them. He'll send them. He'll say, go into all the earth. Nothing mysterious or metaphorical about that. Go into all the earth. Make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. Clarity. Clear words. Nothing parabolic about it. This is the marching orders of the church, and they're clear. And he's going to tell them these things. Well, There's a few insights in here I want to particularly focus on today. Um, As I was reading the passage, I thought, you know, I could give all kinds of definitions of terms for the sake of doing those kinds of things. But it struck me that the passage itself is a rather simple one. And there's something beautiful about that in a time like this, especially when he wraps up the very last things he says prior to praying to the Father. So let's look at the passage again. As he talks about speaking to them plainly, he goes on in verse 26 and says, In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you. Okay? Now at this point, hopefully their understanding of the Father has changed a little bit. The fact that they can call him Father, for example, is something that's kind of revolutionary for them. The fact that they can not only call him Father, but in his own teaching them how to pray, he introduces the idea that they can actually think of him as Daddy. Extremely personal father-child relationship kind of a term. Beautiful, glorious in its invitation. And of course, it's, it's it's probably nothing you don't know, but the mindset that they came into this with, like any Jew of that time, with their history and their background, Uh, would be a a little bit different view of God. They would see him as good. They would see him as just. They would see him as righteous. They would see him as holy. Their idea would be formulated from their understanding of the mountaintop experience of Moses, where the lightning and the uh, the lightning and the and the cloud of smoke and this unapproachable nature of the mountaintop that only uh, only Moses could climb up to. And as he came down with the stone tablets and as they were already violating the law and he broke them. We saw this righteous indignation. They came up and got these new tablets that spoke about the righteous requirements of God. This is where they're coming from. Paul called that a blessing, by the way. In Romans, he says they received the oracles of God. They got God's word. This is a beautiful privilege on their part. But this is what it basically looked like. This is kind of what the relationship looked like. And now Jesus came and said, you can think of him not, it's not like no longer see those things. But in addition to that, he's father, he's dad, he's the one you can come to without being afraid of being accepted by him. 
I mean, of course, we understand the purpose of the cross in all of this. But their understanding is God's chosen people. And then, of course, you know, after the gospel begins to go forth, we have a very, a much fuller picture of what God is like. But he says to the disciples that, you know, you're going to ask things in my name, as he had taught them to. But he says something kind of interesting and kind of weird. I'm not saying that I'm going to ask on your behalf, though. Wait, what? But he says, because the Father loves you, as if to say, yes, you're asking in my name. But you're not just asking me. You actually have entrance to the Father. Wow. After Jesus' crucifixion in Matthew's Gospel, it records how the veil of the temple tore from top to bottom. Uh, It's an interesting detail that he says top to bottom. It doesn't just say the veil was torn, but it was torn from top to bottom. And, you know, there's no exegesis given within the scripture about that, but there is sort of a picture in that that I think is fascinating. It's not like from the bottom they tore it open, but rather it seems as though God sort of tore it from the bottom and from the top down, as if to say, you're welcome to come now. The author of Hebrews would speak of this ability. Matter of fact, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 10 for just a moment. If you haven't spent time in Hebrews, let me encourage you. It's an incredibly rich book that will drive you to worship. But here in chapter 10, verses 19 and 20, the author says these things. Therefore, brothers, and of course, meaning brothers and sisters, therefore, since we have confidence to enter the holy place, by the blood of Jesus, by the new and everlasting way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and with our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope, and he goes on, without wavering. The idea here of coming into the holy place That was unthinkable to the average Jew. And, of course, this letter is written to Hebrews primarily, those who are of Israel nationally, ethnically. And to hear the idea that they can come into the holy place. Now, remember, the holy of all, the holy of holies, was a place that only the high priest could enter once a year and only after many ceremonial washings, we're told. This is not the kind of place that you or I would just sort of walk into. But now we're told we can We can come confidently. We can obtain grace. We can obtain mercy. These kinds of things. We can come to the Father directly now. Jesus is the mediator of a new kind of covenant, one that allows us to come, sinners though we are, saved by grace, not trying to get there on our own, not believing for a second that our efforts will ever amount to enough to do that, but rather as invited sons and daughters. We're invited to come and to enjoy that relationship with him, a relationship of closeness and intimacy, one that we can walk into like sons and daughters. This is beautiful beyond words. And most of us who grew up with some understanding of the Christian faith have sort of lost a sense of just how incredible that actually is. Um, If you grew up in a very legalistic church, you might have a better idea of what it is than most of us. But if, if, you know, for example, if you grew up at a church like this one where we talk so much about grace, where it's almost sort of taken for granted the relationship we have with God, shame on me for letting it sort of fall into that kind of place. The fact that we can walk in and talk to God with such open invitation is an utterly staggering truth. And Jesus tells his disciples that you'll ask in my name, but it's not just about you asking me, it's the fact that you need to understand that you can actually come directly to the Father. Wow. And he loves you. Now these, again, are words that are being spoken as Jesus is wrapping up his earthly ministry. He's about to leave them. They're about to be on their own. And as he says in the passage, that when they say, now we believe and now we understand, now we get it. Oh, do you? Because the time is coming and it's now here that you're all going to be scattered and you're going to leave me alone. What did Peter say just a little while ago? I'll never leave you or forsake you. No, all of you will. All of you will. You'll all scatter. You'll go to your homes. In other words, you're going to run away. And sure enough, in just a few hours' time, the soldiers would show up. They would arrest Jesus. They would run for their lives. Now, again, I'm not going to pick on them for that. Who's to say we wouldn't have done the same thing under the exact same circumstances? 
but he's telling them ahead of time. And in concert with telling them about their failure that's about to happen, he tells them that, in fact, he's not alone, but the Father is with me, and that same Father loves you. Wow, even though he knows what I'm going to do? Yes, even though he knows what you're going to do. The Father loves you. And he loves you because you've loved me and you've believed that I came from the Father. All right? This idea of access to the Father through the beautiful invitation to love and to know Jesus. This is what the believer has to be excited about. But he says, I'm going to leave you and I'm going to go to the Father. You know I came from the Father and now I'm going back to the Father. He's speaking very plainly, very matter of fact. I'm going to leave, but I'm going to the Father. The one who loves you and the one who I'm going to, the one who sent me and the one from whom I have come. And as he's telling them they're going to be alone, he doesn't leave them with just the thought that he's going to be away from them. Remember, now I've said these a few, uh, this, this a couple of times, but putting ourselves in their sandals, we understand that the one whom they've come to depend on in literally every way is about to be gone. And they're going to have to sort of be on their own now. And so he's not pulling any punches, really. He's letting them know what's coming. In other words, he's honestly giving them an assessment of what they can expect in the next few days and the days to come. But having said all of those things, and this is really where I'd like to spend a little time today. In verse 33, I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, be of good courage. I've overcome the world. Earlier in chapter 14, Jesus said, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Also, interestingly, in connection with his departure. In the same way that you put your trust in God the Father, I want you to put your trust in me. In other words, I'm worthy of that. I will not leave you nor forsake you, even like the Father won't. You can put your trust in me in the same way, at the same level that you would believe you could trust God the Father. He's continuing to let them know and bolster their understanding of who he is and what he's capable of. And even though death is coming for him at the cross, it's not the end. Death will not hold him down. He knows that. They don't understand this is how it's going to play out, but he does. And so he's, he's building them. He's helping them to be fortified for what is yet to come. This is an important, important thing for them because what they don't understand, all the things that they don't understand are about to come flooding down upon them. And so he's planting seeds into their hearts and minds that will give them something to anchor to in the midst of those things. And after all of that, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. He says here again in the passage, I have said these things to you that you may have peace. Well, most of the things he's had to say are not necessarily the things that would bring peace, right? You're going to have tribulation. I'm going to leave you, all of these things. But nonetheless, the very telling of it, I'm sorry, give me one second here. I did a MacGyver thing here, and I put a paper clip on the back thinking that would help. Apparently, I'm not as MacGyvery as I thought I was. Really? Oh, I see. Okay. There we go. How's that? Yeah. I'm going to lose tape or chewing gum. That makes for some great video, doesn't it? <laughs> all right. Hopefully that'll work. Okay. Sorry about all that. We're going to have to figure something out. Again, the things that Jesus is saying to them, in large part, are not the most comforting things. He has shared a number of things along the way that are intended to bring great comfort, but the fact remains they're about to find themselves in circumstances that are going to rock their world completely. When Jesus is arrested and they scatter, it's because they're not expecting that. They're thinking he's going to usher the kingdom in right now. As a matter of fact, even after his resurrection, that's the first thing they're asking about is, are you going to set up the kingdom then? You know, it's a big thing on their minds. So when Jesus is taken away and arrested, he's ultimately uh, scourged and mocked and a crown of thorns on the head and mockery. He's beaten. He's crucified. These are things that were not on their radar. Jesus has told them about it, but it's not on their radar. Again, I take a certain... Maybe comfort's not the right word, but there's a certain connection I feel with that. You know, there are some things that I, I don't know that I want to hear, but God tells me anyway. The problem is not that he's not telling me. The problem is I don't necessarily want to hear it, or I don't want to read it, or I don't want to necessarily accept it. 
But he tells me anyway because it's true and it's important that I know it and that I respond appropriately to it. In the same way, Jesus is telling them things that they're, uh, it would be best if they respond, respond appropriately, but he knows they won't. Why? Because they're, they're people, they're human, just like you and me. There go we, but by the grace of God. But he tells them anyway, including the fact that in this world you will have tribulation. I've said these things that you may have peace. The peace that I, that I give you, my peace, as he said earlier, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you, my peace, right? The peace that I experience. This is what I'm giving you to equip you to the, for the buffeting that is about to befall you. In other words, uncertain times are coming, but I'm giving you certain things to anchor to. This is a good word for us. I'm not going to get political. I did that on the podcast I do already. So if you want to get political, you can watch that. What I'm going to talk to you about here today is something that is far more useful and far more important. And that's that we know who we're anchored to. In the world, we will have tribulation. We will have pressure and trial. And we will have uh, all of these adverse circumstances come upon us. They will happen. I don't want them to happen. They're going to happen. Okay? Well, that's not why I come to church. I don't come to church here. The hard times are coming. Look, Jesus cared enough to tell his disciples, I care enough to tell you, and the solution for both of us is the same. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. The natural tendency in our flesh, and I'm not going to ask for shows of hands on these things, because half of you will tell me, the other half will be lying to me. <laughs> I won't raise my hand either, I'll be lying to you because I want to seem spiritual. But the truth of the matter is, is that when things happen in the world around us, especially in times like this where things just seem so uncertain, what happens if the particular candidate wins? What's going to happen here in the United States? What's going to happen to us? You know what? Those might be legit questions. I'm not diminishing that. But has our anchor changed? Let me ask you a question. Uh, do you think that the particular candidate we have in office is either going to speed up or slow down the purposes and plans of God? No. Do you actually think they have any impact on the purposes and plans of God? No. Might affect us, might impact the way we respond to these things. But as the old, what is it, battle hymn of the old republic? His truth goes marching on. Okay? The things that God has said are going to happen, and it doesn't matter who's in the White House, or who's in the Senate, or who holds the Senate, or the House of Representatives. Now, I say that as a voter who has hopes on how this turns out. But, at the same time, at the end of the day, great news term, in the final analysis, <laughs> nothing is changing what God is doing. Why do we vote then? Why not take a nihilistic approach and say, well, what's the point? Because there is unrighteousness in the world and we're supposed to occupy ourselves with his business until he comes. And so we do. Why do we vote a certain way? We vote the way that best lines up with our biblical, our, our, our biblical principles. Not, and not our biblical principles, the biblical principles, right? Not just my view of it. Whatever God has said, we want to do things that honor that and, and promote that. But we do also recognize that the scriptures say that the times are coming when the love of many will grow cold, when people will call good evil and evil good, when it will seem as though darkness is completely taken over. And when Jesus comes back, it's not to come back to a place that's all wonderful and white smock and beautiful and ready for him to come and sit on his throne. No, he comes back and he finds, a not surprising to him, but when he comes back, he finds a world that wants to take him on. Right? Psalm 2. You know, let's break his bonds. Let's free ourselves from him. God in heaven laughs. Is he laughing because he's spiteful? No, he's laughing because it's about the stupidest thing in the world. What? Really? Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. I guess, I, I guess I'm afraid. No, none of this. God is going to do what he's going to do. 
that's going to happen. But when he comes, it's not, to, not to, to walk into a world that's already doing pretty well and just needs a little bit of cleanup. No, he's coming to bring his kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. How many of us have prayed that? I said I would ask for a show of hands. Well, you can raise your hand this time. But <laughs> how many of us have prayed for that? We all do, right? We want it. God, yes, please let things be done here like they are in heaven. Well, as we've said before, and will no doubt say many times again, that means a radical up, uplifting and uprooting of the entire order. You think, you think if a particular candidate gets into the White House that things will change in America? Just wait. You know, every part of the world, every corner, every last square inch will be different when Jesus comes. And I say, bring it. Please bring it. Yeah, it might ruffle my feathers a little bit in some ways if I were still here at that time. But at the end of the day, please bring it. Set up a kingdom where righteousness reigns. Set up a kingdom where nobody can wrong each other, where there's no more tears, where no longer do I have to watch the news and cringe. Please bring that world. If you don't want that world, are you crazy? Seriously, who wouldn't want that? People who are on the other side, right? People who are fighting against him. Those who the Lord will find wanting to take him on. Was that your answer, by the way? I don't mean to cut you off. <laughs> but, you know, Jesus said these things would come. Okay? Now, again, I'm not trying to get political, but I'll, I'll bet a number of us probably were a little bit saddened by the way things went on Tuesday and the days following and the days to come as it continues to drag on. Many of us thought and hoped it would go a certain way, in a very pronounced way. But it didn't. And I guess we can approach that in any number of ways. And by the way, I'm not sure either candidate winning that election, in some part, would not have still been problematic. You know, if you're an always Trumper, I'm not trying to offend you, but I'm not. I think we applaud those things that are worthy of being applauded, and we criticize those things that are worthy of criticism, regardless of who is the one making the decisions. I'm an always Jesuser, right? And insofar as somebody lines up with what Jesus has said, good for you, right on, I can support that. But insofar as you don't, I don't know. And so we have to ask ourselves, if things become adverse, if things become so backwards and upside down and wrong and sin begins to run rampant and evil seems to prevail. Jesus said, in this world, that's going to happen. But be of good cheer. Now that idea of being of good cheer is not the same thing as saying, but just put up with it and tolerate it for a little bit longer. He's actually saying to be of good cheer. How on earth are we supposed to be of good cheer in the midst of that? In the middle of tribulation, in the middle of trials, in the middle of a world that's gone mad. How are we supposed to be of good cheer? The answer is, his, is, is found in his own words that followed. I have overcome the world. That means that even though sin may seem to run rampant now, even though evil may seem to prevail now, at the end of the day, Jesus has conquered that and one day will in fact clean it all up. When you read the book of Revelation, and if you're not a, uh, not, not a regular reader of the book of Revelation, I would encourage you to read it, because in no uncertain terms, we find out that at the end, he wins, he finishes things, he wraps things up, he does all that has been promised throughout all the ages, it will finally be wrapped up and come to an end. And at the end of it all, there will be no more sin, there will be no more sorrow, there will be no more of any of it. What's interesting is that the world is trying to create a, a utopia today. That's ultimately what the goal is, right? A world where no one's left behind, a world where everybody is equal and everybody has got everything they need. And while on the one hand that sounds beautiful, it sounds like something we should be able to get behind, here's the problem with it. They're trying to accomplish it without God. They're trying to do what they did back in the Tower of Babel. They're trying to do what they've done every single time. Uh, some rebellion against uh, God that we see in those early years, or for that matter, any time we've seen somebody trying to conquer the world and set up their own kingdom. They're trying to do something without the Creator Himself, the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords being at the middle of it. And in this particular attempt, like so many others, they're trying to do it not just with them out being in the middle of it, but being having nothing to do with it. And when he finally does come, when Jesus rides through the clouds, and by the way, when we come with him, 
the opposition will be global. Except for those saints that somehow have managed to, during that period of time to come to Christ and, and have made it to the end. But so many will have died along the way, and so much of this world will be even, it'll look like utopia up to that point to the world, but it'll be abhorrent to God all the way through. And Jesus will come and set it right. Now, do we believe that? Do we really know that day is coming? Now, we know it in our heads, right? We have, okay, the Bible says it. Sure, okay, here's, here's the five verses I can point to and all this kind of thing. We know it that way. But do we know it? Do we expect it to happen? Do we truly believe that the day is coming when Jesus will set right all of the wrongs? Do we believe that when Jesus said the world was going to start looking much like what we see today, do we recognize that what that means is that we're getting closer? There was going to be a generation at some point that got here. At some point, some generation was going to be the generation, right? Well, you and I might be it. And I say might sort of in quotes. Because I think we are it. I Seriously. There are some here today who I do not think will grow old. I think that we will come to a day sometime soon when Jesus will bring us home. And I think that because of what the scriptures say. And I think that because of the way the world is looking in light of what the scriptures have to say. When we say that we are excited about his coming, and we say it could maybe today, sometimes it just becomes sort of a rote thing that comes out of our lips. Like we just, hey, it's what we say as believers. This is a time that demands us to remember how true and real that actually is. Jesus' promises are really going to come true. The Bible's word is really going to finally reach its crescendo, and it might be in our lifetimes, and we will get to see the Lord. And that should be about the most exciting prospect in any of our lives as believers. That's something we should be looking forward to with such anticipation that we literally groan every day that goes by that we don't get to see him. You know, Mark passed away, uh, and, and he was ready to go. He wanted to see the Lord. He didn't want to keep fighting. He was glad when, the, when, when he experienced some progress, and, and maybe it looked like things were going to turn around, but he is not disappointed that he's with the Lord. I had a friend years and years ago. Uh, her name was Julia Rhodes. You guys know Julia Rhodes. And she had, uh, I forget what form of cancer, but she was dying for a long time. And finally the days came where she was bedridden. And her daughter Judy had told us that every day she would wake up disappointed that she woke up because she so desperately wanted to be with the Lord. She was so excited and so ready. And she exuded the joy of the Lord up to her last breath. This wasn't like, oh, I just want to be done suffering. No, she loved the Lord desperately and wanted to be with him. And that has never left me. That, uh, literally, that, has, that, that memory has, su has stuck in my heart ever since. And, and, and I, I think about the fact that there's going to be a sound of a trumpet. We're going to hear his voice calling us home. And we'll meet him in the air. Like we'll literally leave this place. And we'll go to be with him and forever be with the Lord. Yeah, yes. You know? I want that so badly. You know, I, my, my heart grieves for those who don't know the Lord. I want them to be saved and all that. But I know that if my heart grieves for that, God certainly grieves even more. And so he's got it. You know? And so if he, if he snatches us away... It just means he's ready to fulfill the purposes he has for after that point. I'm, I'm good to go, you know. In the world, you're going to have tribulation. And we can see that tribulation one of two ways. We can be brought down by it. We can be troubled by it to the point of being overwhelmed. I'm not saying that some of the stuff I see doesn't trouble me greatly. But I think there's a certain righteous aversion to those kinds of things. That is a natural response. But if it gets to the point where I'm so overwhelmed that I just think it's all hopeless and, and what's going to happen, I need to refresh myself in what Jesus said. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. In the ultimate sense, our sins are paid for. We know we have a future and a hope with him in heaven that is just secure and sealed. Matter of fact, I know that we've read this at least once over the last month. But turn with me again to 1 Peter chapter 1. This is day after day, becoming my favorite section of Scripture. 1 
1 Peter chapter 1. If you were still in Hebrews, then you're going to the right a little bit. First Peter chapter 1. And I guess I probably should have said if you wanted to read along or if you just want to sit and listen, either one is fine. Where Peter writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded or kept through, the, through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the testing of the genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Through him, or, or though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. When we recognize that all the things that are unfolding before us are indicative of what, what the world is becoming and root to Jesus' return, we can recognize that in these things God is accomplishing a purpose. God is doing things on a large scale. And unfortunately, as believers, we face persecution as a result of that. In the days to come, we might, as believers, uh, find some real uh, opposition to our gatherings, to our faith. We might find churches losing their 501c3. We might find taxes changing. We might find uh, um, uh, a resurgence of COVID that means you can't gather in groups larger than 10 on a national scale and all these kinds of things that are constantly being uh, kicked around. Who knows what that might look like, but it could look like something that, that disrupts the way that we're used to living, even here in Tennessee. And so when those things happen, if they do, when they happen, we recognize that even this has some purpose in what God is ultimately doing. James speaks similarly to how we approach trials and difficulties. He says to embrace them as a means through which God can bring us to maturity, right? testing our patience and building patience and faith. And so on a large scale and on a personal scale, God uses these things for our good and for his ultimate good and ultimately for his glory. When Paul writes in Romans 8.28, he says, all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. This, this we know, right? And that statement is in the midst of a larger uh, 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 idea where he's talking about our ultimate good. Not just good right now, like this will turn around for good right now, but in the larger good of, of making me more Christ-like, of ultimately working out in me that which God has made me for. Ultimately, uh, that, that redemption that is the ultimate fruit, that, that going home and, and experiencing him in his presence, all the things that happen to me in my life play some part in what God is doing ultimately. And so it becomes sort of an opportunity for us to see things in either one of two ways. We can be crushed by it, destroyed by it, made hopeless by it, or we can see it for what it actually is. Something that should not surprise us, something that has been spoken about often, something that has been described in the scriptures for aeons. And so therefore, since it is, and since this does not mean things have flown out of God's control, instead these things are very much in God's control, that one day he will bring these things to their ultimate, ultimate fruition and Jesus will return. So have hope. Take heart. Take courage. There's a, I'll end with this thought. Um, how many of you have read any or all of the Narnia series? Okay. Right on. My favorite character in the Narnia series is Reepicheep. Uh, he's, for those who don't know, he's this little two-foot-tall, seven-pound rat that is noble and brave, loyal, faithful to his master. If you watch him in the movie, he's funny, you know, that kind of thing. But he's, he's most known for being loyal and brave. And the time comes at the end where he, he stands on the shores of Aslan's country. 
And the choice is sort of there, whether to enter or to stay. And that for him, it's no choice. His dream has been to go to Aslan's country. And Aslan says this to him. My country was made for noble hearts such as yours, no matter how small their bears may be. Heaven was made for you and me. And Jesus calls us to be noble and to take courage and to be brave in the days ahead. Because the time will come where the gateway will be open for us and we'll enter in and it'll be all done. Finish well. Finish well. Let me end on that thought. Um, Are there any questions or thoughts or anything while we have a couple of minutes? Anybody nervous? It's understandable, right? Just remember who's ultimately in charge. Remember who's ultimately in charge. No questions or... I'm sorry? Oh, praise the Lord. Well, um, praise the Lord. All right. Well, then let me pray. Let's stand. Let's worship. And then let's go out there. Oh, I'm sorry, Janet. Oh, yes. I almost forgot again. We've got the October, November birthday cake, right? How many October, November birthdays do we have? All right, Vicki. We've got Vance. Who else back there? Debbie. Oh, Alonzo. All right. Uh, Scott, did I miss anyone? Any of the kids? October, November. My daughter, uh, Nina's birthday is in November. She'll be 18 this year. Uh, tell you what, uh, Alonzo, will you go bring them out here? Bring the kids out out of Sunday school and that? We'll sing happy birthday to everybody. Let me close in prayer, and then uh, we'll bring the kids out. We'll sing happy birthday, too, and then we'll, uh, we'll worship together. Father, we thank you so much for your grace toward us. Father, these are troubling times for many. Uh, Lord, we're going further and further into a world where evil is being seen as good and good is being seen as evil. And, Father, that's troubling. But, Father, we understand that you've got things in control. You've got things in your hands, and nothing has flung out of your grip. But this is happening and unfolding much as you've described throughout the Scriptures. And so, Father, we always knew that one day you would unfold your plans and purposes and bring human history to a crescendo where Jesus would return and set up a kingdom of righteousness. And if that day is coming soon, certainly the day that Jesus comes to bring us home is even sooner. And so, Father, help us to see the days ahead of us, not through a lens of fear of what's happening around us, but rather with faith and confidence and courage that you've got things in your hands, and that includes having us in your hands. Father, help us to finish well. And Lord, if the days do outlast, if, if the day comes, uh, if it takes longer to get to that day than, than some of us have numbers in our lives, numbers of days in our lives, help us to continue to press on with faith and confidence and courage, knowing that when we do finally get there, we'll be alongside of you, we'll be rejoicing, we'll be celebrating, we'll be ruling and reigning. Father, there's so much ahead yet that you've spoken of that we so long to see. So we praise you and thank you for this. Help our hearts to find true rest and peace in you. We know that in the world we'll have tribulation, but help us to be of good courage, knowing that Jesus has overcome the world. We thank you and praise you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.